This is Mitchell McLam, lead pastor of Sapona Road Church in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We're so excited you found our podcast. Our prayer is that you're blessed by today's message. If you would like more information about Sapona Road Church or would like to give to this ministry, please visit our website at saponaroadchurch.com. We hope you have a great day and enjoy today's message. This has been an interesting journey through Jonah, amen? I do hope in some way, shape, or form you have heard and you have seen something in the light of the the Bible that maybe you hadn't seen out of the book of Jonah before. I have. If you have not, either you weren't here or you weren't listening. Because it's not been me, I believe wholeheartedly, my Bible is marked up inside and out on these two pages because I believe God has given some very interesting and incredible relevant, relevant revelation through this book, through this ministry. We see the life of Jonah in a totally different light. We see all the other prophets, the message that they delivered, all of the, the, the word of the Lord going forth. We see all of their, their works, but we don't see really their life. And Jonah's the opposite. In these two short pages in my large print Bible, if you've got a small print, it might be one. In these two short pages, we see this journey that it took Jonah to go through to ever get the message that he was supposed to deliver from himself to the people that were supposed to deliver it. And that's interesting to me. And so here we finish up this week, uh, Lord willing, unless something just happens to jump out later on. We finish in chapter 4, and where we concluded last week was Jonah has delivered the message God called him to deliver. He finally got his junk straight. He finally got on the right path, and rather than going the opposite direction like he did in the beginning, He turned back, and he did what God called him to do the second time. We were thankful for a God of second chances. Amen? So he's done the job. He's done what he's called to do. He went and delivered the message. We talked about that that in itself was miraculous because this was a great city, as the Bible describes it, along with a great fish uh, that all took place. So Jonah's story is pretty great. But the great city required... The Bible says that it would take Jonah three days to see it all. Yet, when he opened his mouth on day one, the whole nation began to turn to God, and the king himself humbled himself down and began to worship. He put out a decree that, hey, we're going to fast. We talked about last week that when we begin to pray, when we dedicate our life to fasting, when we respond to the word of God the way that these people did, God's heart changes. Amen? We can get a response from God. When we respond, God responds. I told you that fasting is not really about God. It's about you and I. It does nothing for God for me to go without a meal today and let my stomach growl. It brings me closer to him. That's the purpose. So we get to chapter 4. And poor Jonah, I don't, I would have thought he would have learned. The dude has been the opposite direction and disobedience to where God's called him to go. He ended up on a boat that almost sank, so he ended up at the bottom of the ocean in the belly of a fish where he thought was salvation. And yet here, after he finally turns, he still ain't happy with what God's done. Chapter 4. I'll start actually with chapter 3, verse 10. You might not have it on the screen, but it says, When God saw what they had done, how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. So chapter 4 picks up, This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran to Tarshish. I knew that you're a merciful, compassionate God, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. You're eager to turn your back, to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. He's talking about what I predicted to the people of Nineveh. If you don't turn from your ways, God's going to destroy. He's saying, I'd rather be dead if you're not going to destroy this group of people. The Lord says, I'd imagine in this calm, cool, and collective voice, is it right for you to be angry? And it's silent there for a little while. 
There was no answer. And it's important because we see this exact same question again in a few minutes where there is an answer. Verse 5 says, Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shadowing him, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away, and as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. God's created all this. You see that? Jonah's the dude that went and sat outside to watch to see what happened. And here God has created first the tree to shade him. Jonah's all excited. Yes, thank you, Lord. But God sent a worm. And not only did he send a worm, but after the tree dies, he sends a hot wind. The sun beat down on his head till he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? He just asked the question, is it right for you to be angry? Crickets, crickets, crickets. But now this plant's died. He says, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah, yes! Of course it's right. Even angry enough to die. It's a tree! Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? First and foremost, God's heart can change. Actually, God's mind was made up from the beginning. It just depended on the people of Nineveh's heart to change. See, Jonah thought that God was, was really ready to destroy this group of people. Go tell them. And we have this messed up ide ideology that God is really waiting on us to fail so that he can put us in our place. That's ridiculous. That is the farthest thing from the God that I serve. A God that gave his only son that I would be able to live and not die. It makes no sense for that guy to wait on me to fall on my face so he can put me down and push me through the ground. That's crazy. And so Jonah, knowing that God is full of compassion and full of love. He's a God that's slow to get angry, and he's full of unfailing love. He knows the heart of God. He just described him, right? He knew the heart of God. And so the only factor in this whole equation that determines whether the people are going to die, whether they're going to be destroyed, or whether they're going to live is the people themselves. You with me? If Jonah goes to Nineveh, which he didn't to start with, he gives the word, he's done his part. That factor is in the equation. The fact that God's unfailing love is going to be there is always in the equation. Right? So the question is, does Jonah's obedience and the word of God calls the people to respond which then somehow works into this unfailing love and grace so that the people live. It does. That's the way it works. And Jonah is avoiding the situation because he knows that if he delivers the word of God and the people respond to the word of God, God's going to forgive them. So the question for me was, if I know the word of God, and I know that if somebody's heart will turn and they will respond to the word of God, they get forgiveness. Why is it that I hesitate to give it to them? Who died and made me God that I can make that decision? 
Rome? And that's who Jonah thought he was in chapter 1. And finally he got kicked in the rear end and he got punished and the Lord sent the storm and the Lord sent the fish and he's, he's, he literally thought he was dying. Made him throw up. And finally Jonah says, fine, I'm going to do this. And then he goes and sits and waits outside the city. He don't even stay in the city. That's completely against the model of the church. If we can get engulfed in the community and we can see a community change, we don't step outside of that community and watch from the outside. We stay in and we live it together. Right? You want us to live together? Join a connect group here in just a couple months. So he sits out and he's waiting. And he thinks God's changed his mind. It never happened that God changed his mind. God's heart from the very beginning of time was that people would know and love him. Right? You and I changed our minds. Not God. The Assyrian people of Nineveh were the ones that had this messed up process going on. Read, read 2 Kings. I was amazed. This morning I went back. And I went digging, and I started at chapter 14, verse 25 and 26, where Jonah prophesied to uh, King Jeroboam II, where he said, hey, you're going to actually get this territory. Your territory is going to grow. These people were still doing evil in the sight of God. King after king after king after king after king were full of evil. Yet God used Jonah in that situation to say, hey, your territory is going to be expanded. Chapter, tw- chapter 14, verse 25 of 2 Kings says that the, the territory of Israel expanded just as Jonah, the son of uh, Gath, Ephah, said that it would happen. I bet Jonah didn't shudder at that one. I'll give that message, Lord. Territory is going to be expanded. He's delivered it to an evil group of people. The people of Israel had turned from God. But he was delivering good news. And now here we see him again, and we learn this story. And there's some backstory, and whether we get deep enough to really understand, the point is the Assyrian people were going to take the people of Israel into captivity. Okay? People of Israel were God's chosen people. Jonah had issues with the fact that the Assyrian people, who were the Ninevites, were going to take Israel into captivity. I don't want them to live. Because they're going to be the ones that God uses to punish us for our wrongdoing. If I won't do it wrong in the first place, God couldn't use them to punish me. Jonah was a patriot. We're fighting for what's right. We're standing up for our freedom. We're standing up for what's right. They, they have disowned God. They're ter- I ain't going to them people. They don't deserve grace. And God had to make a teachable moment. Because he's sitting on the outside. He's looking in. And he's mad. He's angry that God's not going to destroy these group of people. And God said, what right do you have to be angry? You were not, you have no justification whatsoever as part of this equation. You're simply a piece of the puzzle that was supposed to deliver the word. That's all. But yet you're angry? Angry enough to die, Jonah says. If you're going to save them people, you might as well kill me now. So God puts a tree in the ground. And this tree grows up. And I think it's all miraculous in the first place because you ever seen a tree grow over the course of a day or two and grow leaves enough to cast shade? No. So the fact that Jonah assumes or has this issue that we're fixing to experience in a minute is dumb. 
Every good and perfect gift comes from above, right? A tree don't just sprout out right beside where you decided to plant yourself and have a pity party and grow over you just by happen chance. It's only miraculous that God gives you the grace to cover your head even when you're having a moment. And he lets him experience that for just a little while. I've been in those moments where God let me experience in my pity party a good day. Things were good. Oh, thank you, Lord, for that shade. Even though I know that my heart's full of hatred for those people that I really don't want you to say, thank you, Lord. It says in the middle of the night, as morning, the early morning hours, but God sent a worm. Because just as fast as he'll give, he'll take it away. Just as fast as he'll pour out blessings on your life, I'm just saying, they're not yours. He can pull them right back. I was watching a pastor preach in my office this morning talking about capacity, and and we only can be filled to the capacity of our life. There's a big difference between a little mouthwash cup and even a little solo cup and a five-gallon bucket. The people that that have the, the little mouthwash cup, that's you. You're begging for more God. Give me more of God. God, give me more of yourself. But you're complaining because of what you've been given. I'm just telling you what he said this morning. Rather than turning around and looking at ourselves and seeing, I have nowhere else to put anything else. I've got to expand my capacity. We all had the same possibilities, but the capacity is within us. But then the five-gallon bucket slammed full of water. He filled it up with four big pitchers of water, and there's still room at the top. The, the ones that work all the time, and they're traveling, and they're raising their kids, and they got it all together, but they still show up to church early to serve, and they're doing all this different. The capacity, the God's pouring more on them, but their capacity is bigger. So Jonah... Being the way he is, is having this party. And the worm comes in the middle of the night to take away the blessing. I think God did it just to prove he could. That's the moral of the story. We serve a great God that wants to pour out blessings on us, but he requires some obedience. And his obedience isn't about waiting on us to fail so he can kick us in the butt. The obedience is walk in my way and your life will will be this life full of abundance. So the worm eats the root of the plant. That's interesting. He don't go up and start eating the leaves so it can be seen. He eats the root of the plant. That plant dies from down deep from the stem, from the life source. Some things in life, we need to allow God to get to the source of so he can clean them out. The tree dies. And that's not enough to get Jonah's hard-hearted, hard-headed, block-headed attention. God's got to literally knock him on his rear end. So he sends this vehement wind. The New King James calls it a vehement wind. A scorching hot wind. The sun beating down on his head. One commentary said that, he, that they believed he had a heat stroke. A sun stroke is what they called it. God let me die. I can't live like this. First of all, you're the dude that went and sat down outside the city to watch them fail. God's not going to pour out blessings on us when we go sit outside the city to watch them fail. We weren't created to see anybody fail. We're not created to see anybody go to hell. Shut up complaining if you're sitting on the outside of the city and you're not doing nothing to make a difference. (laughs) 
He said, I'd rather die than live like this. And God, again, I believe in that nudge of a voice. He said, you think you got a right to be angry? First of all, you're the Dumbo that sat here. You just left a city with 120,000 people. No, they're not like you. They might even be your enemy, but raise a hallelujah in the presence of your enemies. Suck it up, buttercup. You're the, you're the one that sat here. And you sat here with a heart hoping that they would fail. You sat here to watch them be destroyed like a fireworks show from the outside. You think you got a right to be angry? You didn't plant a tree. It was miraculous. I give you the tree to give you shade in the first place. Sure, I took it away from you, but it won't your tree. Because every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. Everything that I have belongs to him. If he wants to take it all away tomorrow, I'm going to have a pity party. I'm going to struggle. But I still love Jesus. You think you got a right to be angry? He said, you care more about a tree than the 120,000 people. The souls. You care more about a stupid tree that won't even yours than this nation full of people. You can go to jail for beating your dog. You touch a sea turtle on the North Carolina coast and they'll fine you a hundred grand. But there'll be babies that show up tomorrow morning to the schoolhouse, run into the cafeteria because they ain't had nothing like that to eat all summer long. We got some messed up thought processes. We care about the tree that won't even ours in the first place. But we can't care about people. What are we doing? We already discovered that we're no different than Jonah. Right? We weren't any different in chapter 1 and we're not any different in chapter 4. It's a whole lot easier for me to care about me and mine and what I've got and what I don't got and, and the, the, the life that I've got to live that ain't even mine in the first place. Then this massive harvest of people that maybe they know Jesus but maybe they just need some help. We can't do it all. I'm not naive enough to think we could do it all. We could not. I, I don't. I believe we could. Anything's possible, and I'm crazy enough to almost want to try it. We can't solve Fayetteville's homeless situation here tonight. Realistically, logistically, tonight, maybe tomorrow. But before the end of the day today, we, we probably can't. Does that mean we don't try? I can't fix. I can't I can't feed all those babies that are going to show up to the schoolhouse tomorrow. I can't feed them all. But what am I doing to try? None of us have got it all together. Me will be the first one to say that. I don't have it all together. I don't have all the answers. I can't just say, hey, this is how we're going to do this. I need you to sign up and put a sign-up sheet out. And I can't do that. It don't work like that. 
If that were the case, there'd be no point to the rest of the body. It doesn't work like that. All I can do is do my very best to give you the heart. The heart of God in this little old chapter of Jonah that you've read over and over and over. And probably never had it turned to a gospel evangelical message. I want to just give you the heart. I'll give you the resources to the very best of our ability within the stewardship of this house. I'll give you the resources if you could come to me and say, I got a vision to do this. This is how I'm going to make it happen. This is how much it's going to cost. This is what we can do. If it makes sense and it's within the vision of the house, I'll give you the resources. I'll put some people on a team to help you. We don't see it, do it sitting here for an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes on a Sunday morning. We lost our focus. In our personal lives, not only as a house, we've lost our focus of Nineveh. The big bad wolf ain't worth saving he's not worth healing put him in a cage and let him stay there i'll worry about me and mine what, what i've got this beautiful tree casting shade on me i'll handle this right i'll sit right here on the outside and look in we got it backwards I tried to find myself in situations, and it's always after the fact, because if I do it right, I don't go back and critique it. I do, most things. But I go back and replay circumstances that I walk through whether it be something as small as going to Walmart, whether it be a how I handle the situation with our babies, whether it be how I respond to something Micah says. There ain't no reason that like we're perfect. Whether I get mad because I've lost my patience in a situation out in public, Typically, that's not what makes me mad. What makes me mad is people abusing an opportunity to spread the gospel. Very little makes me mad. That ticks me off. Don't abuse an opportunity or a moment and waste it on something ridiculous. If you do, don't tell me about it. But I try to replay and find the missed opportunities. And I ask the Holy Spirit to give me those moments. First of all, I ask for the Holy Spirit to lead me and direct me, lead my path today in a way that I can touch somebody. Whether it be within my house, whether it be within this house, whether it be out in the community, it doesn't matter where it is, God, lead me and let me touch somebody. I fail a whole lot. And I fail because I'm focused on a tree that's beside me that's giving me shade that I didn't even put there in the first place. And miss where God leads and directs me to go. I miss that young lady, that guy that's just broken and hurt, that just probably needed somebody to say, man, you're doing awesome. I was somewhere the other day. I don't even remember really where. The guy getting up shopping carts last night at Walmart looked at me like I had lost my mind when I told him he was doing an awesome job getting those carts out of the parking lot. 
But I bet he didn't forget it when I got in the car and left. It's taken me a long time to get to that point. It didn't just happen overnight where I said, I'm going to make sure I do this every, I'm the guy that wouldn't talk to nobody. It's taken moments. We could play something soft for me. I got to wind this thing down. I'm done. My weight's been lifted. It's Holy Spirit's job to handle you now. It's taken me a long time to get to the place that I would put myself to the side and open my mouth and encourage somebody. And God's used situations like working for a bb and branch. I was not in a church. I dealt with some interesting people. One little man come in every month on the Fed. By the time he ever made it there, he didn't have the money that just got dropped in because he had already spent it the month before. When his check hit, it was gone. But he come in every month on the third. It's the third. I got I got to see here on the third. We never once had a spiritual conversation that I know of. But I learned a whole lot of how to open my mouth and be encouraging and talk to people. It's not some deep theological concept. It's not some deep spiritual moment. If you got the love of Jesus, you should open your mouth and spread it. It's not easy. I get it. Because I'm the biggest introvert you've ever met. I just soon when I get through, go to my office, shut the door, wait till all y'all leave. Then I walk to my Jeep. I'm just being real. So when you see me hug your neck, you see me pour something into me, hey, have a great week, you know that that's not me. That's learned. And because of what I'm called to do, because I'm called to encourage, because I'm called to make a difference, I learn how to do that and I put it into practice. I won't go to my office and I won't go sit there and wait for you to leave. I'll hug your neck and tell you I love you. With the fullness of my heart, I do. I'd rather go sit up under my shade tree. But you and I have not been called to go sit up under a tree that you did not even plant. Who is it? What's your Nineveh? We got a community full of people as a house. We're reaching nations with our outreach, with our missions. That's not what I'm talking about. What's your Nineveh? What is it that you'd rather sit on your tail and keep your mouth shut than see that person have a little bit of light in their life? Don't be the patriot that thinks they deserve to be alone. Don't be the patriot that thinks they deserve to hurt like they're hurting. They put themselves in this situation. Bull. Maybe they acted and their their actions caused them to be in a situation. They didn't put themselves here. The influence of the evil in this world made them to act and respond. They're going to pay the consequences. But they don't deserve it any more than you deserve it. You didn't plant your tree. Got families. We got kids on ball teams that we don't even know. The mamas and the daddies go to church. We got people we interact with on a daily basis that we don't have a clue anything about their life. Because we'd rather sit up under our tree that we didn't even plant 
than step into and find out what's going on. I'm not sitting on the outside of the city to watch it fail. If you do that, you're doing it without this guy. Probably not by yourself because somebody's going to do it with you. But it doesn't make it right. God's in control. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His understanding is is beyond anything we could ever comprehend. His understanding is, is infinite. He knows all. He is all. He's everywhere through every moment of time. Your situation has not struck him by surprise. You sitting outside the gate while you watch that city fail, even though we wouldn't admit it because that would be horrible to admit that. He knows. He knows the people that we would rather sit back and be quiet just because it's our nature sometimes. Maybe it's not the evil spirit within us. It's not that we've got this bad mentality. It's just that it's easier for us to sit back and be quiet. It was raining last night when I tried to tell the dude at Walmart he's doing a good job. I was wet. I just assumed getting in the car, but I knew he was somebody got to put in my path, look me right in the eye. He needed to know he's important. I didn't tell him Jesus loved him. I didn't tell him he's going to hell if he don't quit sinning. I ain't got a clue what his background looks like. All I did was let him know he's important. He matters. It's up to the next person to tell him that at this point, my job in that moment was done. God knows it all, and he's in control. I believe sitting in scripture this is what's heavy on my heart first of all out of my personal experience that I share with you from week one the whole purpose of Jonah's call to Nineveh had nothing to do with Nineveh It had everything to do with Jonah. My disobedience, my call to a place where I stepped out of that path. Those people are great. They were great before I got there. They were great when I left. Pause for a moment. There's a man named Bruce Wolfson that he passed away this week. He's Got stung by a bee, severely allergic. He worked with me. You think we got a can, a lot of can lights in here? We had at least double can lights in a youth facility we built. He worked with me day in and day out, hanging lights, all kind of stuff, and he passed away tragically this week. He's got a lot of family in the church. I can't imagine that church this morning. They just had a vote last Sunday night to, to push for a new budget, push for a new building, and he was the first one to stand up to support that vision. And this week he took his last breath because of a bee sting. The people were fine before I got there. They were fine after I left. It had nothing to do with that group of people. My journey to Nineveh was all about me. I don't believe. I'm sorry. If it had been about the people of Nineveh, we'd have learned more about the people of Nineveh. All we know is he gave a five to eight word prayer, a message, and said, hey, either you're going to repent or you're going to be destroyed. They turned from their ways. That was all we know. But it took four chapters of him to tell his story of how that message took place. What are we missing in our life? Our little Dixie cup is full and we're complaining because we're to capacity, but we won't expand our capacity so God can pour more in because we're not willing to go the extra step. We're not willing to take the extra moment to speak to somebody and step into that Nineveh. We'd rather stand on the outside than go into the middle of the mess. I don't know anything else about Jonah after that point. I believe he took his slap in the face 
And he took his beating that day when God said, you care about a tree, but you don't care about these people. I believe he had to have taken that, that whooping that day, and his heart had to have turned. He walked out of that experience a totally different man than he walked into it. He had been through hell, literally. We can't grow unless we make that journey to Nineveh. But it's got to be personal. I'm going to pray, and I want to, you need to know your Nineveh. The Holy Spirit needs to give you your Nineveh. And then you got a choice whether you're going to be obedient or whether you're going to turn your tail and go to Tarshish and go through who knows what to ever make it back around to Nineveh. Father, God, I opened my mouth today and I've done my very best under the power of your Spirit to deliver this word the way you would have had it delivered. God, it's set heavy on my heart as the Holy Spirit laid it on me with a responsibility and an urgency calling us to make some changes in our lives. Father, we see the outcome, the results of disobedience. We see what Jonah went through as he disobeyed and it still took him all the way around full circle to come right back to the place you had called him to go to. Father, you're calling us not to sit outside the city, but to be right in the middle of the situation. People you've put in our life, God, that need to know you, that need some encouragement. They just need the hope that they're important, that they matter. God, each one of us have got a, a place we don't want to go. A relationship we don't want to form person that we don't want to be a part of who are we to decide who lives and who dies who am I God to decide who gets to know you and who doesn't Holy Spirit I pray as you've already laid something on our heart that you begin to convict us for a few moments Come on, let's pray for clear paths to Nineveh. God, that you would order our steps. That our eyes would be open, that we would walk in obedience. Holy Spirit, as you nudge us from one place to another, from one person to another, that we walk in obedience of what it is you've called us and created us to do. We're willing to go the extra mile. We're willing to go to Nineveh. We're willing to make a difference to the people that are close to us, the people that we know, the people that need you. We don't get to decide who we, who we go to and who we don't, Lord. Lord, you've called and you've appointed us. You've set us apart to be different. I pray for boldness from the Holy Spirit to make those changes, to make those differences, to open our mouth when, it's, when we want to shut it, to, to get off our, our rear when we'd rather sit there under that tree. God, let us come out of our pity party sitting under the tree that you planted for us. Stop complaining. Get off of that, that high horse, Lord, and let us go to Nineveh and make a difference for you. There's people all around us everywhere we go. I thank you for second chances, Lord. I thank you that if we've been disobedient and we've avoided those situations, we've avoided those relationships, you're bringing us right back full circle so that we can walk right back into what it is you created us to do in the beginning. Right what you all called us to from the beginning. God, we're walking right back into those situations, right back into those scenarios because you're a God of second chances. Your mind's not changed. Your mind was made up that everybody that believes in you would have life and have life more abundantly, that we would have life eternal. God, your mind was made up a long time ago. The only, the only variation in the equation, Lord, is the individual. God, let us do our part to deliver the word so that as we deliver a word of encouragement, the word that you love people, God, that their hearts would change. They would respond to your word. And as we've learned already from the people of Nineveh, when they respond, you respond, Lord.
God, turn our hearts. Father, let it be difficult for anybody that knows us, anybody that comes in contact with us, anybody that we see. Lord, let it be difficult for that person to die and go to hell. Let the light of Jesus shine through us in a way that overtakes darkness and brings hope to somebody's heart. God, that they would have a hard time going to hell on their own, Lord, but they would have eternal life, Lord. They would see something through the way that we live our life to make them want to turn, would make them realize that they're important, they matter, there's hope in their life. Father, I thank you for what you've done in the house today. I thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. I thank you for minister and teach one of our hearts i pray that something's been twisted up inside of us something's been stirred up that a new life something's been rooted down deep that we won't let die out father but we'll let it grow we'll let ourselves grow into who you've created us to be who you're calling us to be father i thank you for your love Lord, I recognize that everything that I am, everything that I have, is all from you. It's not mine, Lord. Father, and I won't be focused on that rather than Nineveh. I thank you for the growth that will take place in our lives, the way you'll stretch us as we're obedient to you becoming the person you've created us to be as that takes place as we walk on this journey with you, Lord. Father, I thank you for every person that's here today. It's a part of this family. God, I pray for new visions, Lord, creativity to take place in this body. God, that you give heart for a ministry, Lord. You give direction for something to make a difference. Lord, you've blessed us beyond measure. God, let us pour that back out and reach the people you've placed us here to reach. God, I pray blessings over each family. I pray that you keep us and you bring us back again. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.